ever for the session Arms and the Man, the Bangladesh Bloodbath. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How's the festival going for you guys? You know, it's a festival. You're supposed to look happy. When you give these serious looks to us, we get very nervous out here. So, just lighten up a bit. And we have a serious enough topic. Yes. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, uh, we are here to talk about arms and the men. Now, all of us know that war is a very ugly business. But, given the human proclivity for violence, it is an essential business too. After all, we cannot forget that warfare is the second oldest profession in the world. And on every battle, every war, hundreds of books have been written on it. Fiction, non-fiction, the whole bag of tricks. The 1971 war for the liberation of Bangladesh is a very fascinating war in many ways. Just to quote the London Times, it was one of the fastest campaigns fought. It was something like the German blitzkrieg across France. And uh, in, in modern times, it is definitely one of the fastest. Uh, it is a, a war in which another nation was liberated and another army was brought to heels in as less as 16 days. So I have here with me on the panel two wonderful people, Salil and Sadaf. Sadaf from Bangladesh and Salil, who's just written a book on Bangladesh, on the same war. Now, I will definitely be coming to you guys with a lot of Q&A, because I don't have many questions to ask. And it's really hard to think of intelligent questions. However, I will kick off by asking Sadaf. Sadaf, you are a post-71 war woman, born in UK, brought up in the US. How come the sudden interest in the 1971 war? Um, I was actually um, born in USA and grew up in the UK. Um, and it was, the, the war was something which was, um, I think my earliest memory was on my father's shoulders, hearing him say Joy Bangla in a crowd. Um, I think it was probably in California. Um, and it's, it's something which, um, as a Bangladeshi, I think you grow up with. Um, but recently, um, uh, and I've, uh, I've been back in Bangladesh for over 20 years now, um, and involved with the women's movement for many years. And what I, what I discovered a few years ago, three or four years ago, was that despite being very involved with the women's movement, I didn't, I had heard about the women who had been raped and the atrocities that happened in 71, but it, it, it was very much sort of just mentioned as a statistic, as a number, and not that much more. And I think three or four years ago, I was actually shocked at how little I did know. And when I started to find out about it, um, it was a journey of discovery for me that as a woman in Bangladesh, I was ashamed that I didn't know where these women were now. And so I tried to find them uh, through my women's organization as well. And I met them for the first time a few years ago and talked to them. Uh, and I really feel that as a country, what happened to them in 71 was atrocious. But our treatment of them since then um, is, is, I think, worse. Right. So just to put this in context, because there are a lot of people here who were not there when the 71 war happened, over 200,000 women were raped, murdered, and mutilated by the Pakistan army. And uh, a major genocide had already begun, which is what led to the Indian intervention and finally the creation of Bangladesh. And you, Salil, how come your sudden interest in this almost forgotten war? Well, it's not very sudden. So, uh, I was a 10-year-old school kid in Bombay when the war started. So I do have vivid memories of sticking black paper on uh, windows and seeing cars with, you know, their headlights being screened off, the lone figure of the home guard saying lights out every evening and so on. 
I remember parents cooking food for soldiers going to the front. And much before that, you mentioned the 16-day campaign, but the war was actually a nine-month-long sure. war. It started on 25th of March. We should never forget that in India. The India was involved for 16 days, but Bangladesh had suffered for nine months before that. And <clears throat> that had started. Refugees had started coming in. I had staged a play in Bombay for, for them raising a very small amount, about 130 or 140 rupees in those uh, children's play which we had sent off to the Bangladesh committee. So there's a personal element there. And then later in life, I worked a lot in the field of human rights in the last few years. And there is a very interesting part to this war, which is that usually when conflict takes place such a long time ago, there is really never a sense of settlement or a closure. Old wounds remain buried, and then sometimes they come back in grotesque forms. Now Bangladesh is trying to fix that. And it's trying to fix that through these tribunals. And we can talk about that later, how effective they are. But at, at another level, in, in 1986, I went there as a young reporter. And I got to interview a man called Colonel Farooq. And he's the one who gives the, the, he's the colonel in the title of the book, the colonel who would not repent. He and his brother-in-law, Rashid, masterminded the conspiracy that led to the assassination of Mujibur Rahman. And I felt that, how is it that somebody has killed the father of the nation and he's able to, or at least the one of the fathers of the nation, if you want to include Zia or Rahman in that pantheon, and that's a very controversial issue in Bangladeshi politics. But let's say Mujib, because he was the leader of the civilian side of Army League. This man has killed the president and gone ahead with it, lives in a posh part of the city, is able to live with impunity, and uh, he has been a presidential candidate. And some of his other colleagues who had been part of the conspiracy, some of them were parliamentarian, some were made diplomats. So that culture of improvement in impunity and the kind of immunity there was also grotesque. Hmm. And that continued my interest over the years. Right. Now, before we talk about your books, I have a, a, a question. But before that, how many of you guys have got or read Salin's book? Anybody? Well done. And how about um, Sadaf? How many of you guys? So one month later, we'll come back here, and I hope all of you will raise their hands. Well, for those of you who haven't read the book, please pick up a book after this. It's, it's really interesting. But then you will know why I want to ask them this question. Sadaf, you, your book has a fascinating title. Tell us about it. Um, it's called Sari Reams. Um, and I, I took the title Sari um, because it's, it's a word which sort of entwines our past with our present. Um, I think the long history of wisdom and tradition that I've kind of drawn on mm -hmm. um, from, I think, my collective sort of um, strength from both England and the UK uh, and also Bangladesh and actually the greater Indian subcontinent, this 5,000 year old history which is part of who I am. Um, and the versatility of the sari, to be able to sort of wear it any way I want. So this is kind of, I guess, an expression of the coming together of all different sides of me. Huh. Okay. And the title of your book is pretty long. Yes. It's called The Bangladesh War and Its Unquiet Legacy. Oh, is that right? Or is yeah, the, that the colonel who would not repent, the Bangladesh war and its unquiet legacy. Okay. So the colonel who would not repent, as I said, is Farooq. He was unrepentant and uh, in fact he didn't seek clemency till a few hours before he was executed. Till then he kept, kept saying that he was a great patriot and he had saved the country from a disaster. That was his argument. And it's an unquiet legacy because on one hand it has been a suppressed memory. Once Mujib died, it was almost impossible to talk about that past without revealing your political affiliation. And it became impossible to talk about the freedom movement in a, in, a, in a way that showed the civilian leadership in a positive light. There was a divide between those who were, some of the Mukti Bahinian soldiers who had fought for the war, who had felt, and this is what Farooq personified, that Mujib and other, Mujib was in a Pakistani jail, but Tajuddin and Khondakar and others were actually in Calcutta, um, you know running the government in exile. And they were seen as people who had benefited from Indian help, but did nothing for the conflict. Now, of course, that was not true, but that is how the, some elements in the military saw it. So there was that part which was an unresolved conflict. The other unresolved conflicts, were, which we can talk about later, was whether Bangladesh was a Bengali nation or a Muslim nation. 
Right. And, 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 and these questions were never addressed. And yet, they, at the same time, they were simmering. One of my most moving experiences was going to the Char region, south of Noakali, little villages, no electricity and so on. And the villagers had tears in their eyes when they were talking to me about what they had experienced, because in 43 years, nobody had come to talk to them, to ask them what had happened. So all th that legacy has remained buried, but it is unquiet. It, it was bursting to come out. And I thought it was my, with all humility, I thought it was my responsibility to listen and capture the stories. Coming back to your earlier uh, point, you said that the guy didn't repent right till his execution. Sadaf, what is your take, patriot or criminal? I love doing this, you know. When I'm <coughs> sharing the thing, I can really ask the tough questions. I, I believe that he really believed till his death that he was a patriot. Uh, patriot. Are you planning to stand for politics anytime? <laughs> no, did you notice what she did? I um, believe he believes. Uh, I wanted your opinion. Well, if Bangladesh would be a lucky country, people like were her in <laughs> politics, yeah. <laughs> so, what is your opinion? Patriot or not? I mean, I think we have a. It, it, the book by Masquerade is a legacy. It was called A Legacy of Blood. Um, and I think. It was a, it's a very difficult situation for us looking back because one of the things is that um, we have this sort of um, word that we've coined, shortik it, itihash. That means that what is the correct history? And throughout our history, we've had different narratives um, depending on the difficult political scenarios that, have, uh, that, that we have arrived at today. And I think that's one challenge of younger people to actually you know, know the situation. Um, so I actually... I don't think I'm well enough informed to be able to sort of say what happened in 74, 75. Um, but I believe that at a time where um, uh, there, there are different ways that you can go along your path as a nation. And um, when you do close all forms of freedom of expression, then it can come out in dangerous ways like this. You should definitely go into politics. She spoke for two and a half minutes. She did not answer the question. What? Very well done. Okay. Right. Now, um, could you like to, would you like to share a little about the Birogona woman? Yeah? Yep. <laughs> I'm sure they would all be very keen to find out what happened to these ladies who suffered at the hands of the Pakistani army. Where are they now? Um, one, one of the things actually, and, and it was not just the Pakistani army, it was also the Razakars, who were the Bangladeshis who um, collaborated. Club. They were the collaborators. Um, and what happened was, um, in 1971, many women were uh, raped um, and they were taken to concentration camps as sex slaves. Um, and it's an estimated about two, as you sort of mentioned, at least 200,000 women went under this. And, um, what happened was, which was extraordinary, was six days after uh, the war ended, the then uh, newly formed government gave the women an honor, calling them Birangunas, or the brave women, and recognizing their role in 1971 um, as, as being survivors of 71 um, and the atrocities that they faced. Uh, and this, but this name, Biranguna, and, and, and they had set up rehabilitation centers uh, to sort of give them um, all sorts of support. But unfortunately, and they, they had detailed records. But unfortunately, 1972 and onwards, because I think there's, there's one thing that we all have to contend with in uh, the wider issue of rape and the stigma that's attached to it, the government started to burn the records so that these women wouldn't be stigmatized. And after 1975, the centers were closed down. And these women were left to fend for their own. They were often turned out by their communities, ostracized by their families, not given employment, not, get, not given payment, not even given prep burial. And um, the, the government also didn't give them anything in the way of compensation. Uh, many babies were born. I think about 25,000 babies at least were born um, and taken away from them. Um, and uh, many, of, many of them were sort of adopted abroad. Um, and so uh, when I was trying to find out what had happened to them, I met um, some women in Shiraj Ganj. Um, and I was very shocked at the way that they had lived all of these years. Sadaf has written a, a really moving poem on uh, the Biragona women. But before I ask her to read it out, Salil, 
what has been your association with the play which has been uh, done on the Birogona woman? Yeah, so there has been a play in London, staged in London and also in Dhaka called Birangona, done by Lisa Ghazi. She's an actor and writer and, and so on. And which basically tries to trace the story of a very happy young woman who is married and who is taken away by the soldier and the story of her life and what she suffers. And Sadaf, in fact, was one of the two women who helped me meet a lot of the Biranganas in Dhaka. She is involved with an organization called Nari Pokko and another one called Nijera Kori, run by Kushi Kabir. And actually, one of the things I am very happy about and proud about in the book is that there are almost 28 interviews and testimonies of the women who were raped. And although they seem similar, the stories, there are slight variations. Some women have been taken back in the families, and in many, they have been shunned and so on. And what also happens to them, in fact, is that when the family finds out later, the son finds out 12 years later, 15 years later, that this is what happened to my mother, then, you know, she is, then he dissociates himself from her. So they're extremely tragic stories. Everything Sadaf said is absolutely accurate. Women were denied agency whether they wanted to hold on to their kids and not give away for adoption. Often they didn't have the choice. Sometimes the kids were taken away for adoption. And there were, Bangladesh changed its law to permit late-term abortions so that a lot of kids, a lot of uh, abortions also took place at that time. And that was a very, both those things were rather difficult for a predominantly conservative Muslim society to do. So the play gets into some of these issues. And another poet, uh, Tarfia Faizullah in the United States, she has also been writing about it. She's written a book called Seen, which goes into some of these issues. And one of the most interesting stories is of a woman called Fedosi Priyav Bashini, uh, who was used as a sex slave in near Kulna. Uh, and she was probably raped eight, nine, ten times a night over the nine-month period. And after the war is over, she comes out, she hears similar stories being talked about, and she raises her hand, hey, this is my story. And she becomes an incredible champion and votary of their rights. She has spoken at global conventions on comfort women, sex slaves, and so on. And the very beautiful and hopeful way to end the story is that she has become a magnificent artist. She takes things that people have thrown away, branches, trees, uh, um, leaves, and, and refuse of the humanity and convert them by turning them, twisting them and making it into beautiful objects of art and they're genuine artworks. It's not something that is remarkable because a victim has done it. It's remarkable in itself as art. And I think in a way her story is a metaphor of how beautiful these lives can be but how they've been snuffed out and stopped. You know, before I, I ask the next question, I just had a sudden thought and I thought I'll share it with you. The other day I was at a school talking to school children and there was this young kid in the audience. The question I had asked the audience is, how many of you children have been to a literary festival? This wasn't in Jaipur. And this young kid in the audience says, I've been to one and I have a question for you. When you guys sit on the stage, are you talking to each other or are you talking to us? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Well, what do you think we are doing right now, talking to each other or talking to you? Right. Okay, uh, before I ask you to read uh, Sadaf, you know, I have also written a book on the Bangladesh 71 war, and when I was writing it, I faced a very severe challenge. I had never f experienced this earlier in my life, and, and this has been my 14th book. And the challenge was that being a soldier myself who has seen combat, and interviewing soldiers whose story I was going to tell, I was very stressed whether I would do justice to it, whether I could, because war is a very emotional business and the emotional tempers were very high. My fear was, will I get carried away by those emotions and lose my objectivity? It, it was, I have never felt this in my life. Now, my question to you, Sadaf, what was your biggest challenge in writing this poem? What happened with, you know, I didn't write it to sort of, initially, um, after I'd been talking to um, these women, I was just so traumatized and so emotional for a few days. I just, it, it just came out of me as a sort of therapy for me and just a sort of cathartic effort. And in fact, six months later, and I even saved it under sort of something else. I didn't even, it, I didn't write it as a poem. It was just an outflow of grief and, you know, deep, a deep sense of despair. 
And um, a few months later, uh, I just happened to open the file, not knowing what was in it. And uh, I basically didn't have to do that much to, to, to put it in poetry form. Uh, and this was only because um, when I read it later on, I just felt that perhaps I'd be able to convey some of the emotion that I felt. Would you like to share your poem with them? And guys, this is the only poem she will, she will share with you. The rest, you are supposed to buy the book and read it. Be nice. Birangona. Heroic one, the name bequeathed you. But you would have to be much more than that in the years to come. The wrong we did by you, we all knew what you went through. Never black and white, fighting through the greys, the multiple ways you had to. <laughs> that official line, our mothers and daughters lost their honor, rather than the other way around. Those who found they got away with crimes against humanity, while all that remains is the shame stuck on you. Whatever you do, you can't shrug off the stain we create. You survived your fate to find family won't take you in, woman of sin. <coughs> Difficult to find work, not paid if you do. After all, why pay when one can say she is loose to discard and use and abuse? When the police and military came next time round, it was you they offered. What did it matter if they soiled you some more? You are no longer the mother of your son, who found out what you had done, didn't want to hear what had been forced on you, terrified and disgusted, he and you back then, to bear wounds never to heal, which changed your life and death, as no one gave you a piece of cotton to wrap your lifeless body though your soul left 40 long years ago. When you were cornered as you ran, then it began, men like giants on you, till you got used to it. And when you found freedom in joy and longing, you were reviled and defiled by your own. You are the one who dressed up and wore gold, and you sold your dreams to the enemy but your menfolk and homes were left alone for the sacrifice <coughs> of this unsung dilemma. You are the one who was caught when 10 of them found you in the dhankip, left you half dead as you jumped in flowing waters, but found yourself still alive on the other side as you were pulled out like a fish in a net, afterwards <coughs> not able to say, that your feces dripped constantly till the day when you could take your own life. You are the one who was stripped bare when you dared to tie the sari length around your neck and when you tried again with your long thick braids, your head was shaved and like a captive animal you were starved to get you to, to obey to what they say till you had no other way out. You are the one whose husband shunned you when you could no longer satisfy him. Of course, never yourself, too scarred inside and out, even though your mother-in-law said it was not your fault and ensured you a home. You are the one whose husband cradled you after their semen dripped down your swollen insides and legs and loved you till he was killed by local thugs, greedy over land, and you have turned out by his family and left to beg. You are the one whose beautiful brown-eyed girl has blossomed in a faraway place, in a different time and space, the chosen land. She will never understand and will never know how you could bring all to tears with your sweet, lilting voice, milking ballads of your soul or the endless years of anguish and pain you felt at giving up a very part of you. You are one of countless, whose story was never told and never will, 
as all records were burned, and you will never come forward, as your pr people brutalized you over again, as your government washed its hands off you, and your sacrifice doesn't want to know what you went through then, and still are now, if you managed to survive. <clears throat> How does that make you feel, Salim? It brought back some of the stories and faces of the women I spoke to. As I said, uh, the women whose stories that she recounts in this poem are some of those women that I've also met. And uh, she captures in an extremely vivid poetry. I, I, I gave voice to their words. And yes, it, it, of course it brings tears to the eyes. But more important than that, it should build, a it should build from the reservoir of anger to try to get something right here. I don't necessarily think that there will be justice of the kind they want, partly because of what Sadaf just mentioned, that in 1972 and 73, much of the records that existed were burned. Consequence of that is that today in the tribunals, if you want to bring up a single case of sexual violence before the tribunal and the judges, the judge is going to say, OK, where is the forensic evidence? Where is any evidence beyond hearsay? And there is none because the early first information reports, whatever records that were kept at that time, everything has been burned, partly to protect them and partly after the 1975 revolution, which uh, led to the assassination of Mujib. So the very sad reality that they will not see justice and closure that they want. And therefore, it's all the more important for the society around them to understand that when a woman is raped, it is not her fault. If she is a victim of violence, and uh, always, 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 rape is a story not about sex, not about erotica, but about power. And I, you know, I, think, I think one of, the, I just want to add something. I think, um, you know, a lot of the women, what they want now is, I think they just want their voices to be heard. They don't yeah. want their stories to die with them. Um, and, you know, um, I first got into this hearing um, uh, and a very powerful poem, uh, about the comfort women of Korea and um, during the Second World War. And um, I, had, I had kind of, I don't know if it's sort of the way history sort of repeats itself or whatever, but you know, they had started talking out in the 1980s, and so now it's sort of 40 years on. I don't think the women themselves are expecting trials or anything like that, um, but they do want, I think they want a bit of respect. You know, they, their grandchildren even now are maybe not even allowed into schools because of who they are. Yep. Um, and so when we had actually the, the play Birangona that I'm talking about, um, and a lot of young people had grown up thinking that Birangona was a very prejudiced word. They didn't realize all the history behind it. And um, when we actually performed the play, which is based on their testimonies, uh, there were two interesting things that happened. One is when we took it back to Shiraj Gond, which is where these women were. Um, they wanted all of the sort of good and great of Shiraj Gunj to be there. And when they were there and they were accepted, uh, that was um, a kind of huge satisfaction for them, even though it was extremely traumatic for them to sort of see their own stories being played out in front of them. But they sort of said, look, we've been going through every day of hell since it happened. One more day of hell won't matter, but at least we can see that we're being recognized. Um, and the second interesting thing was this play by Lisa Ghazi was done in English as well and toured around the UK. Uh, and there was a lot of anger from a lot of young um, British Asians who said that, look, we've grown up hearing about the war from our parents, but we've never heard about this issue. And there was a lot of anger. No, I, I quite agree with both the things you pointed out. You know, I had this, um, it was a very strange um, um, encounter. She talked about the Korean comfort women and um, I was in Bali, I was sitting on the beach, and there was this very old lady in the deck chair next to me, and I noticed that she was crying. So I thought she was unwell, and I asked her whether I could get the hospital, uh, the, the hotel staff to come and look after her. She said, no, I'm fine. Then a little later, after about half an hour, she just told me I was here earlier. And then she was silent for another half an hour. And then she just started talking. I don't think she was really talking to me, but she just needed to say it out loud. She was a comfort woman, and whatever she shared was so stunning, it, it, I could not wrap my head around it. And that's why I believe that 
poems like this and books like this and incidents like this need to be written about. The human mind needs to understand when we say 200,000 women were raped, do you even get a, a handle on that number in your head? Do you even understand what it can do to the psyche of a nation? And if we do not write about it and read about it and, and actually put it out there and talk about it, then history will repeat itself. If we do not learn to learn from the past, then the past will recur again and again. There would be another genocide and another genocide. That's why I really loved being put on this panel and I'm really happy that Sadaf shared this wonderful poem with us. And uh, I hope you guys read more about things like this and internalize them because there is a lesson there. It's not about that one person, it's about the fact that it could happen again and again and again. During, just before the 71 war, Ted Kennedy is said to have visited one of the hospitals where these refugees had been bought in. Now I wasn't there, but somebody who was told me that he cried. He saw people who had been mutilated, breasts cut off and all kinds of things done. And it is said he cried. Despite that, what happened on the world stage? Nothing. Who paid for those? Nothing. So at least I think when people like uh, Salin and Sadaf get involved with uh, these causes, they are helping to create a closure, at least for the people who suffered there. They should realize that their lives and whatever they suffered did not go to waste. OK. Um, Can I just come in sure. on that? Because you mentioned Ted Kennedy, who was, of course, a Democrat, but this was the time of the Republican administration. And if Gary were here, he would have wanted to jump in here. Yeah, Gary Bass has yeah. written this very good book called The Blood Telegram, which really talks about <clears throat> the very brave act of one American ambassador. It was not the ambassador, it was a deputy ambassador based in Dhaka uh, in East Pakistan at that time called Archer Blood. And he saw the, what was going on and he approved the sending of a cable by 28 of his staff, which warned the government of the US that what we are doing, we are on the wrong side of history, that we are ac accessories to genocide. You know, one of the instructions that had come from the State Department at that time to the consulate in Dhaka was that if your staff is Bengali, and if it wants refuge in the embassy compound, you must not take them in because we should not, quote unquote, interfere. And the result was that Yahya Khan's administration and General Tikka Khan and Rao Farman Ali and so on in, Pakistan, in East Pakistan were able to carry out the Operation Searchlight. And one reason the US looked the other way was this grand geostrategic per preference. They wanted to open China to break the, 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 the power of the Soviet Union, as Russia and its uh, 14 other republics were called at that time. And, and therefore, to have a relationship with China, it wanted a conduit, and that conduit was Pakistan. So in order to make sure that that apple cart doesn't get disturbed, if something else happens, that's collateral damage, and that's what happened. Uh, thank you for bringing that out. Because, you know, nothing has changed much. <clears throat> I, I work uh, as a volunteer for a UN project in Afghanistan, and I'm uh, shortly starting work in Iraq, helping to rebuild capacity. It's amazing you see the same thing repeating itself. I have seen a school of 200 children. None of them had both legs and both hands. They were victims of landmines. And nothing happens, nothing changes. I have seen, I have met with this lady, she is about 62 now, and she, <coughs> during the height of the Taliban regime, used to teach girl children in candlelight after darkening the windows because if the Taliban found out, they would behead her. Three other associates and friends of hers had been beheaded. So nothing really changes. Geopolitics, strategy, nations move on. But we as people have to somewhere take a stand. Because still the silent majority starts speaking out. Nothing will change. It was a few, a handful of uh, Nazis who carried out the genocide. The silent majority stood there silent. But it in, was, sorry. Sorry, you know, but in, in, talking about Pakistan in that context, you know, one point worth noting is that after the war, during the war, a lot of Pakistanis were against the war. I mean, it's very easy to say that all Pakistanis were responsible, and it's unfair to say that. 
Uh, there were commanders who were conscientious objectors, officers, not commanders, who were conscientious objectors on, on this issue. After the war, there has been a book called We in Pakistan, O Bangladesh, an Apology, written by the Civil Society of Pakistan. Uh, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, a poet, and Salima Hashmi, his daughter, has been here at the festival. Faiz actually wrote a poem called Dhaka Se Wapsi, because he goes to Dhaka and finds that it's the city is no longer the way it used to be for him. So uh, it, there are issues like that, but Pakistan did want to make amends, and some of them have wanted to. And, and just, just to connect the two threads of Birangana's enclosure on one hand and Pakistan on the other, one point I wanted to raise was that one of the earliest killings was of a professor called Jyotir Moe Guhatakurta, whose daughter is a famous um, academic called Meghna Guhatakurta. And I'm writing, I've written about what happened to him. He was taken out and he was shot and he died three days later on the first night of the, uh, of the <coughs> Operation Searchlight. So I asked Meghna later, what would you do today if you were to meet the colonel or commander who gave the order to take out your father, she was 15 at that time. She saw the father being led away. And she said, you know, I don't believe in death penalty and all that. I just want him to explain what he did and why. I want him to express remorse. Then I can forgive. It's very easy to tell me, forgive and move on. But how can I forgive if there is no remorse? So I said, OK, what would you like Pakistan to do? She said, you know what, I've been to Berlin, I've seen the Holocaust Memorial there, and I would like Pakistan, Islamabad, to have a memorial like that, so that people in Pakistan realize what was done in their name. And lots of Pakistanis don't know that. I've, I've looked around in literature, there's one story called Bingo, written by a Pakistani short story writer, which is in Muniza Shamsi's uh, collection, and her daughter Kamila, in her novel Cartography, writes about how, how the West Pakistanis used to look down on the Bengalis, calling them bingos and so on. But other than that, that recognition hasn't happened because of the way the system has operated hmm. there. So what's your take on it? Memorial? Apology? No, I mean, I think that, um, that you know, as a nation, Bangladesh itself has a lot to come to terms with. Um, and I think the acknowledgement, um, you know, I, for many years, um, I came across Pakistanis um, when I was, you know, at Cambridge and other places, um, showing a complete ignorance of what had happened. And these were very highly educated, yeah. elite Pakistanis, middle class Pakistanis, who either, either they didn't want to admit themselves or had not, you know, the education system hadn't taught it. So I think that this acknowledgement um, and apology is, is an important step. Um, a citizen's apology, um, a, a, I mean, a government apology, but, um, you know, having said that, I mean, um, ha literature festivals or spaces where these conversations can start uh, is a good first step. And um, when Kamala was in Dhaka a couple of years ago at the uh, Hay Festival Dhaka, uh, on an, a, a session on 1971, she said in her 14 years as a published writer, um, she's never felt such warmth and generosity from the audience than she has anywhere else. So I think these are very important steps. And what she said was it was uh, important to have sort of difficult and important conversations, um, maybe in, in forums like this, mm. um, because I think the human connection is very important here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this issue here, because I definitely want them to uh, get a sense of uh, Salil's book. Salil, how about sharing something about your book? Read from it, you mean? Uh, up to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I can tell you what it is about, and then maybe if time permits, I'll read a little. It basically starts with this kernel, but then to understand what happened in 75, we have to look at the 71 war and the build up to it. And one of the crucial issues was, of course, that Bengali Pakistanis wanted a nation, uh, the nation to recognize their identity. And the rest of Pakistan wanted Urdu. And right in 1948, Within days of independence, one particular parliamentarian called Mr. Datta actually comes, and he's a Hindu pa Pakistani who raises this issue. And he was also one of the first to be killed in 1971 um, uh, when they went to his place in Komila and did that. So it starts there. It talks about the buildup of the Mukti Bahini. It talks about the Indian interest, first out of compassion and humanity, because you have the refugees coming in. Later, logistical and military support on the, on the technical side to the Mukti Bahini. And then once Pakistan takes the, in my view, a rather foolish step of in attacking India, giving India the cause to retaliate, you know, on December 2, 1971, India retaliated, and in within two weeks, the war is over. And then, one of the great things is that most of the refugees go back, and most of the troops return before the 25th of March, one year later. 
And, and that's also another remarkable part of that intervention. Then the story talks about um, uh, Mujib's killing, the chaotic period that followed, uh, uh, Ziya's killing, uh, and the, the current drama that is being played out now of the two women unable to be in the same room at the same time on one hand and the tribunals that are going on which in a way are trying to secure justice and closure but at the same time it could be viewed as a situation where one side is trying to dictate and change the map political map of Bangladesh by eliminating a political party. One final thought on the protests that led, Shabag protests, which led to the uh, overturning of a particular verdict of Ka on Kadar Mullah, who was one of the people found guilty and given a life sentence and then it was increased to death sentence. When you talk to people who support the Jamaat, they will tell you that this is a fight between the believers and the atheists. We are the believers, we have one view of Bangladesh. You are the atheists and you want to create a different kind of India type country. Whereas what I've seen is, and, and I was there on the in the first week of Shahbag, that you would have the muezzin's call coming from the mosque and people would lay out the carpets, they would be dressed in the traditional Muslim dress, they would say their prayers, immediately rise and sh start shouting, Pashi Chai, we want death penalty. So it was very c a crude caricature to say that this was a religious versus a non-religious. It was really people who wanted justice of their, on their own terms and people who wanted impunity. That's what it was all about. And, and, and that's what the book goes into. And, and my final hope, and I mean, we're talking about poetry, so I'll just read out a very short extract from Tarfia's poem, you know, which brings in both the issues of the Bengali and um, um, uh, Muslim identity on one hand, and on the other hand, it talks about the Birangona, because her poems are all about the women who were raped. And this is what she says. Are you Muslim or Bengali? They asked again and again. Both, I said. Both. Then rocks were broken along my spine, my hair a black fist in their hands, pulled down into the river again and again. Each day, each night, river, rock, fist. So this is exactly what was going on at that time. And one of the things, again, talking about the two identities, uh, is the failure of, uh, I mean, the nostalgia on the part of Indian Bengal on one hand, that, you know, they are just like us. And the image I've talked about is the seen from one of Ritwik Ghatak's films where the train is going towards the end and reaches the border and it suddenly comes to a halt in Komal Gandhar. Now in that image, and, the, and at that time the film actually comes up with a sarangi and playing the tune which almost sounds like a cry of anguish. And Ghatak says that India never understood that cry of anguish of Ansuya's heart in his essay. And I think not, pa Pakistan didn't understand that either and I think that has been at the heart of this tragedy. Okay, <clears throat> may I request you guys to just help me out by coming up with a few intelligent questions because I'm kind of run, run out. And after that, there and there, yeah. Uh, so what I believe is whenever war is fought on a foreign land, there is a very thin line between when it is fought for liberty and freedom or tyranny and oppression. The Bangladesh war was indeed fought for freedom, but today when we see that war is fought in Vietnam, Iraq or Afghanistan, it is fought for oppression. And when these countries arm um, rebels in Iraq and Syria, and then th when those rebels turn into ISIS, they leave Iraq and Syria alone. Dude, what's the question? Yes, sir. What's your question? So when, uh, when countries arm the rebels, and when these rebels turn into terrorist organizations, some countries leave those countries alone as victims. So, sir, what's your take on that? What makes these countries leave, and what is the solution? So the problem here is that the international law is quite unclear about a very important doctrine called the responsibility to protect. Now after the Rwanda genocide, there was a move at the UN actually to see whether there can be a situation in which the international community can step in and take a positive step to end tyranny. Now the usual examples I cite are when Tanzanians went into Uganda to get rid of Idi Amin, when the Vietnamese went into Cambodia to get rid of Pol Pot, when the European and American forces got rid of Bosnia, Milosevic's regime, and India and Bangladesh. As four examples of external military intervention which were driven by moral impulse of responsibility to protect the innocent. 
Now, why this has fallen apart is basically because of the way the Iraq and Afghanistan wars took place. Now, I don't want to re bring up the debate again whether the wars were right or wrong, because at least in the Afghanistan case, you could argue under international law, US could have retaliated. But because the UN was ignored at that time, what has become very difficult now, and which is one of the problems at the heart of the IS controversy, is for the international community to intervene. Because the basis that you have to provide, the moral impulse of responsibility to protect, the doctrine has got hurt. Well done. Thank you. Can you pass the mic down, please? <clears throat> OK, guys, we may not be able to go all the way back, because it's a little hard. There's a little place to move, so yeah. Maybe those who are at the back and who are with burning questions could come forward, perhaps? I mean, I don't know. That might help. Go on. Thank you. I don't know about the intelligent question, but this is a curious question. Uh, I want to know something about the army. When you said that this high number of rapes, so these are these high number of military people who have done it. So was it, was the army given some kind of a freedom or was it overlooked? And, no. uh, and, and after all, I understand army has some kind of a discipline. Yesterday we were discussing whether it is the Indian army or the Pakistan army. An army is an army, they have certain sense of disciplines and things like this. That's question number one I'm asking. And I just want to add a second question to it is… Can we answer the, the first one first? One, this is related to that only. This is just related to that. On the Indian side, I understand that nothing happened like that and the, uh, the woman I would say were almost respected. Uh, was it because of the short time of the Indians there and nine months there or how it was? Thank you. Okay, so the first part of the question, uh, and I'm not making a value judgment on Pakistani army as a whole today but the conduct of the army in 1971 in Bangladesh. So that's the context in which I'm speaking. There were people at the upper echelons of the army and Pakistani society who never saw Bang East Bengalis as real Muslims. There have been statements made that we have to create the better race out of them by impregnating them and having more children with Punjabi blood or whatever. And there are speeches like that from, from, from commander. And one of the, um, I forget the name, Raja. Raja is the name of a brigadier who actually quit his term and left and wrote a memoir. He actually talks about Niazi speaking in these terms. And one Bengali officer is so shocked by that that he kills himself the next morning. Uh, when he hears. So uh, there was obviously a breakdown. And on the second question about the Indian Army and its role, I'm told that the Indian Army did back very well. Now, whether it was because of lack of time or not, I can't speak for that. But one of the important roles the Indian Army played was at the end of the war, there was a great desire for reprisals and killing the Biharis, as the Urdu-speaking Bengalis, Urdu-speaking East Pakistanis were called. And they wanted to actually, you know, kill them and torture them because some of them were collaborators, like Razakar that Sadaf is talking about. And there are instances, well-recorded instances, of Indian Army intervening and protecting the Biharis, as they should under the Geneva Conventions. I, mean, I think the, the worrying thing in the first part of your question is, is that, yes, it was a very specific strategy of war. I mean, it's nothing new, but yeah. it, it, it was a very calculated, you go into a village, you separate the women, and, you know, they even had such things as if the prettier women are kept for the officers, and... Yeah. Um, and this comes out again and again in, in many people's testimonies. Okay, I have a very definite answer for you, sir. An army is a blunt instrument. And when it is sent in to do a job, sometimes it can go overboard. However, and since, especially since war is a very ugly business, and any army, it needs to retain its sense of sanity and humanity. Any, any nation, and I'm not saying this only about Pakistan, but any nation where the army loses its soul when they start beheading combatants and raping women, that nation is doomed. There is no ambiguity, and it has not changed. Even today, you have a soldier being beheaded. A combatant is supposed to be treated with the respect that he or she deserves. Thank you. Sir. Hello. Hello. This is not a question, this is more an observation. Uh, what the link between clandestine naval operations in 1971 and, and to some kind of poetic justice for all the women and children who were raped by the Razakas was the naval operations recruited about 500 Mukti Bani who operated underwater. And they were recruited predominantly from people whose wives and sisters and kids were raped by the Razakas. So often when these people caught up with the Razakas, 
uh, they were left to their own devices and got their revenge because when the frogmen were caught by the same people, they were mutilated. But the success of clandestine naval operations in, in Pakistan, I mean in East, East Pakistan at that time, basically derived from the fact that they just chose people, not only like just good swimmers, but whose families were affected by the rape of their kids or wives or children. And that is one of the key thank, success factors. Thank you for the observation, sir. We will just stick to questions. Yeah, please. Have just pass it back. No, yeah. but she's got the bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. One second, there's a lady no, behind you. The lady has a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. My, uh, you, the panel has been discussing uh, numbers, you know, how 200,000 women were raped. There was a book by Sharmila Bose uh, uh, some years back which contests that figure. I just want to know uh, the panel's opinion on how, uh, you know, when people were saying that she's actually pandering to the uh, Pakistani propaganda that India and Bangladesh are uh, collaborating and, and bringing a bad name to the Pakistan army and the nation itself. Do you have uh, an opinion? Yeah, no, I have a lot to say. There's a section in the book on it. So, but I'll be brief because I've said a lot more. Whether it's 3 million dead, as Bangladesh says, or 26,000, as Pakistan claims, it's impossible to prove. I've been to a place called Chuknagar where one of the worst massacres took place. Sharmila Bose claimed that only about a couple of dozen people died and people there say 10,000 died. Clearly the truth is in between. What I do know is that people were killed and their bodies were dumped in the river and never found. People who were killed were actually refugees who were coming from other parts of Khulna in order to go to Shatkhira and then cross over the border to India. That was the situation there. So it's impossible to get that number. Now the rape figure is interesting. There were at least 300 known sex camps, okay? Each camp had between 30 to 50 women. The women I have spoken to, the kind of, the women that uh, Sadaf has spoken to, Tarfia has interviewed, all of them say that when they were in a camp, eight to 10 incidents of rape took place. Do the math, 200,000 is a conservative figure of the number of instances of rape that took place. I don't know what Sharmila Bose's motivations were and what her, what, what, what the rationale of her writing that is. She has tried to forensically dissect what the Bangladeshis are claiming. She had not shown a similar zeal in questioning the claims on the other side. So there is a bias question there. And what I, the conclusion I've come to is this, that you know, in, this, in the end, numbers don't matter. Even if it was only 300,000, not 3 million, it was a crime against humanity. That's it. Uh, Ma'am, one sec, Sada, anything? No, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Salil, Salil said. And, uh, and I, I mean, I think that's, that's the thing, that an, an, an awful atrocity took place. And I, I, f there's, I think refuting, there's, Naeem Mohammed's come up with an excellent refuting yes. essay, to, which, which um, I think that he really researched each and every point that he pointed out in detail, um, flaws in her research approach. Ma'am, just a, 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 another point to add. Is it important what the number is? If one is run, that is one too much. E every one of us is a human life, it needs that respect. So the number to my mind is completely redundant. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, sir, yes. back there, yeah. I will not wait for a mic. So the mic, please, I was pointing at you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mukul. Thank you, Salil. May I? put in something slightly uncomfortable in this whole no, discussion. No, sir, sir, because this, of time, it has to be a Indian question. The Indian complicity in letting go the war criminals of the Park Army, and I am talking from first-hand experience. Yeah. There were 83 people against whom war crimes trials should have taken place. For reasons of real politics, India let them go. We are complicit in this crime. Correct, and Bangladeshis will agree with you there. The figure I had was 195 that out of the 93,000 prisoners of war who were in India, about 195 officers and men were quote-unquote alleged war criminals. But in... Sir, thank you okay, very much. Okay, fine. It was between 83 and 195. Next question, but, please. But it did happen, but India wanted its own POWs back. That was the reason, yeah. Do we need uh, so many nations? What futures of all these nations do you see? Oh. I didn't get that. Uh, who would you like to answer? Because this is a tough one. I'm going to pass this this side. No, I didn't get the question. Uh, Any of you? Why do we need so many nations? Oh. So nations that. are, I will only quote what Benedict Anderson has said, that all nations are imagined communities. 
I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, could you pass the mic to that gentleman? Yeah, the lady in uh, the red pullover. Uh, just back to you. Yeah, we have just last question. Yes, please. Can you pass the mic there? Uh, sorry, guys, but both of them will be available back there. You're welcome to do the Q&A there. Yes, ma'am. This question comes from a girl whose forefathers had migrated from Bangladesh during the Indian partition. So I've heard a lot of these heart-wrenching stories. Okay, so secondly, my question might be a little off topic, but then recently we've had a lot of discussions about the illegal migrants from Bangladesh. And then Ms. Mamta Banerjee, the Chief Minister of West Bengal, pops into the image and says... What's the question, dear? Mamta Banerjee says that I'm okay with illegal immigrants as long as they worship Madurga. So, nationality or religion, what is actually important for our nation? Uh, I don't know. Would you like to answer that? Didn't I, exactly I think get the, it, the yeah. right answer, from my perspective, is that neither are important. Humanity is important. It doesn't matter which God you worship. It's just a name which you have given to that God. The God who made us has no name. That's my perspective. And also Thank about you. the illegals who come in. All I'm saying is they're coming because there are jobs here. That's all. Okay, last question. Last question, please. Uh, can we have the lady? Yes. The lady takes priority. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, we are talking about rapes and we are writing about rapes. So in your opinion, what uh, our government should read this books like Virangana so that they can realize a pain as women is suffering after being raped so that they can bring out a strict law rather than giving a seven-year rail and that to after fighting so much. Sada? I didn't get the question. Okay. Could you just crystallize the question in a single sentence with a question mark at the end? Yeah, I'm asking that what our government should do to bring out a strict law for uh, girls being raped. Ah. Oh, um, you know, I've, I've been working on the issue of violence against women for many years. Um, and it's, it, I think it's also all about, we have, in Bangladesh, we have very strict laws. But it's, it needs a total relooking of the issue, I think. Um, I, I don't think that necessarily laws will, will, uh, will be the thing that will solve it. It's attitudinal problem and it's okay, resisting it. Okay, I'm really sorry I have to cut this here, but yeah. can we, I just we have a time out here. Uh, just one sure. All I'm saying is that it's not a problem for the government to fix. Parents have to train their boys to treat girls that they meet better. You know, thank you so much for being here. I just want you to leave you with one last thought. War is a terrible business and nations need to exercise it with caution. And for us, we need to remember. I will just quote uh, Desmond Tutu. He said, it is only by standing up to the rights of girls and women that we truly measure up as men. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience.